think we'd probably go ahead and get started. We got about an hour here. I'm hoping just to, to go through um, what the title says. But uh, so breaking up into a little bit talking about uh, Git and command line and well, back up a second. Talk about where open source is and kind of how to get involved with open source. Um, Git command line, Git for desktop, and Git online. Um, go into some government specific concerns about licensing and privacy and security and stuff like that. Uh, and then finish up with some kind of best practices for community engagement and getting involved with the open source community. Um, but make that as entirely interactive and entirely adaptable as possible. Uh, my passion is uh, open source and supporting open source, so I'd love to help you make your job uh, as easy as, as possible. So um, uh, if you haven't met me yet, um, I'm Ben. I'm from GitHub. Uh, we're the largest code hosting service in the world. Um, and I am a open source developer and a former government employee. Um, so who here, who here is familiar with open source software, commits to open source software, uses open source? Oh, that is awesome. Uh, and how many, how many WordPress, or excuse me, WordPress, how many GitHub users are, are here that has a GitHub account and commits? Oh, I'll breeze through everything then. Let's make this super, super duper easy. Um, my goal is if you have not you know, committed a single line of code or at least are familiar with the terms um, around GitHub and around open source that by the end of today, by the end of this hour, um, that you'll feel more confident and you can be, at least be conversant in open source, right? Um, and so we have about an hour, we'll say 15 minutes at the end, uh, and then we go after that directly into a break. Um, so I'm glad to chat more down uh, in, in the, by the snack area. We can get some, get a soda or, or something like that. So that sound good? Is that, is that, if I'm going too fast, just throw something at me. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Like I said, I'm here to help you. Sweet. So what is open source? Um, at its most basic level, open source is code for which the, under, uh, the underlying human readable source code uh, is made available for anyone to use, to modify, uh, or to contribute to. Um, that's what it is at, at, at its core in a dictionary definition. Um, in practicality, open source is a development workflow that has certain constraints. Um, and despite these certain constraints, can produce better software than its proprietary counterparts. Uh, you can think of it somewhat as the story between Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, you have a bunch of hobbyists on the weekends, a bunch of people really passionate about very specific subjects, uh, and they can all often produce better results than their purpose-built proprietary or closed source counterparts. Um, and the interesting thing about open source is it's rarely two people working on the same thing at the same time, and it's rarely people working at the same place at the same time. You don't have cubicles, you don't have office space, you don't have whiteboards, um, and this really interesting workflow makes really, really great software. Um, but in order for any of this to happen, you need something called version control. Uh, at its most basic level, version control is simply who made what change when. Uh, if you've ever used uh, Microsoft Word's track changes, where every time you make a change, it underlines it in green or red or blue. Um, it's kind of like that, but think of it uh, on steroids. Right? Uh, geeks know that if so much as a single character is off when you're building software, uh, the entire software application is going to come crashing to a halt. So you need really, really great tools that geeks have developed over the past, say, 30 years or so um, to track minuscule changes down to the character level, uh, whether proposed, whether, whether realized. Um, so this might look like a familiar image for you. This was actually a screenshot of an email from when I was in government. Um, and this is how the government focuses on version control, right? Oftentimes, whether you're collaborating on a Word document, whether you're collaborating on a piece of software, uh, you'll send an email out to your team with a zip file with a Word document attached to it. And the file name is always something amazing, like revised, final, final, revised, Ben's edits, and the string of numbers that at one point represented a date, and it now is just like, I don't know, lottery winning numbers or something, right? And you send it around and you say, hey, can you get these changes back to me uh, by close of business so I can get everyone's feedback? And the problem with that is, I, as, as a contributor to that, right, so I send you that file, or you send me that file and I send you back some feedback, I don't know, did you miss my comment, right? Did you just ignore it, like, did it get sh lost in your inbox? Um, did you discuss it with coworkers? Was there actually a decision uh, regarding the merits of my comment? Did you think it was stupid? Do you have a reason for why you thought that my comment uh, was stupid, right? There's not, it's a very opaque process, it's a very cumbersome process. Uh, there's one single point of failure. It's very prone to error. So geeks use what's called Git, um, G-I-T, uh, or, or JIT. I don't know. Some people pronounce it differently. It's like JIF and GIF. Sorry, OK. Um, <laughs> too soon? Too soon? No, I'm sorry. So Git. Um, Git is a distributed version control system. Um, what that means is that everyone that collaborates on a piece of software uh, uses this. They have a client on their computer that can read in that format um, and keeps track of just who made what change when in a very distributed way. Uh, so if I'm in Washington, DC, and I make a change to a file, um, and Mark is in Philadelphia and makes a change to a file, uh, we can still collaborate on that same project, even if there's no centralized server that's like coordinating 
that are centralized persons that's coordinating that. Every change gets a cryptographic timestamp that's based on the author and that the change was made. And it makes it really easy to merge different histories together, right? So we can all be working on different things at different times. Um, there are other version control systems that are that kind of preceded Git uh, that were more centralized version control systems. Uh, if you've heard of SVN or CVS. Um, so Git is kind of what's the, the big up and coming what the cool kids are using um, because it's distributed, because you can use it anywhere. Um, and Git doesn't care what you're collaborating on. You could be using PHP, you can be using uh, C++, you can be doing text files. Uh, as long as it's just some sort of text, as long as you can manipulate it on even, even images, right? As long as you can manipulate it on your computer, um, Git can track who made what change when. Um, so you can kind of think of this as kind of the workflow for how open source works today. Um, an author publishes out source code. Maybe I'm the creator of Ruby on Rails or Joomla, and I publish that source code up to, to github.com or to, if I'm WordPress to my own Git server or Drupal to my own Git server. Um, and I as a collaborator, I as a user of that software find something I don't like. I say, you know, that sidebar is stupid. It shouldn't be green. It should be red. I found a typo. I really wish I can customize this timestamp. So I go ahead and I make that change because in open source, I have access to that code, and I can make that change. I then would then submit that change back to the maintainer, back to Drupal, back to Joomla. Uh, and the community has the opportunity to discuss that. All, that all happens out in the open. It's no longer I send Bob an email, and maybe he sees my changes, maybe he doesn't. There's all of a sudden a public forum and a public place to discuss those changes. Um, the community generally kind of reaches a consensus. This is a great idea. Uh, or, oh no, Ben submitted one another in his stupid comments. Let's just ignore that. Uh, and then the author, the maintainer of that software, simply has to review that community consensus, accept or reject it, and then republish the software back out. And that kind of just kind of happens cyclically and naturally within Git. Um, so where does GitHub come into play? Uh, we do other things other than make little kitty cat stickers. Um, we're actually a software company as well. Um, GitHub is a social layer on top of Git, on top of all this magic, uh, that just makes it easy for technical and non-technical people to collaborate on software source codes. You don't have to know all that black background green text command line, and so you don't have to know that Mark working on that software in Philadelphia so that we can find each other. Um, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, um, Git hosts, uh, GitHub hosts those Git repositories. Uh, everything I'm talking about today is going to be completely free as long as you're talking open source. Like I said, I'm just an open source developer and I'm passionate um, about open source. On the government front, uh, we have about 500 government organizations that are using GitHub and about 10,000 active government users. Um, from the, for the NAGWA side of things, it's about 150 federal organizations. I uh, just did the math right on the way over here, so I should remember this. Uh, it's called about 10 counties, about 20 states, and about 30 cities. Um, so it's up on the rise and you kind of, we, there was a blog post a couple weeks ago, you can see a chart that everyone's kind of um, kind of jumping on the, the open source bandwagon. So for me, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and so with Git, you take that same exact process. We have some different terminology. Um, and this is just kind of a very high level overview of the way the open source community works. There are other uh, Git hosts and other co code hosts that use pretty much the basic same broke flow. Um, I would, as a contributor, I would create my own copy of the software. I'd download the software to make my changes. I'd make my changes. That's adding some commits. I'd open up a pull request to submit those changes back to the author. The community would discuss, the author reviews them, and it's merged and deployed out for everyone to see. So this is an extremely high level. Um, you'll see these icons and these terms come back a couple times before. Um, but by the end of today, I hope that, that you would feel comfortable talking through, or even better, walking through this process with your own um, organization software, or maybe WordPress, or Joomla, or Drupal, or Ruby on Rails, or jQuery, or an open source pro project that's out there in the world. So that kind of high level, um, what I'm hoping to talk about today in order to do that, I want to introduce a character. Uh, his name is G-Man. Um, G-Man is an open source Ruby gem that I maintain that just all it does is simply identifies government email addresses. So if you give it an email address, it says, yes, this is a government employee. No, this isn't a government employee. Um, and we're, oh, OK. Oh. <laughs> Yes, it verifies whether or not they're working for the man. And it has about 15,000 state and local email addresses. Um, the content of Gman isn't that important, but I just thought we could, because it's such a simple topic, we can use it today. We just we'll walk through the process of con collaborating and contributing to Gman. So I'll just be using that throughout examples. Everything sound good so far? Am I talking slow enough? Any questions? Using strange words? All right, sweet. There's a lot of jargon involved. So honestly, just throw your hand up if I, if I start saying merge the pull request and you're like, oh, fork you or something, right? <laughs> All right. 
So Git. Like I said, Git is an open source uh, so, uh, piece of software that existed well before GitHub. Uh, it was created by Linus Torvalds, the same creator, the guy that created Linux. Um, and it's used in a uh, system agnostic way, language agnostic way, framework agnostic way. It doesn't care about any of that. It's actually, its power is that it's so stupid um, and that it, it just tracks who made what change when across files. Um, so in order to get Git installed, the most easiest way to do it uh, is just to head to windows.github.com or mac.github.com. Uh, those are big, shiny, green download button. Um, and that will install uh, a GUI and also the command line tools and also keep everything up to date so you don't have to worry about patching and dependencies and stuff like that. Um, if you're the kind of guy that likes to, or, or gal that likes to work on their car on the weekends and wants to get your hands a little bit more dirty, um, gitscm.com is where you can get the actual raw source code for Git. Uh, but then you have to take the time to, to keep it updated and patch it and make sure you're, everything's in your variables and all sorts of jargon buzzwords. So uh, that's how you get Git installed. Once it's installed, it's incredibly powerful. You can use it to view software, to pull down software, to check out different versions of software, and obviously to contribute to software. Um, so the most basic part of Git, the most basic command is git init, short for initialize. Um, so here, this is an example. Let's say I'm just starting my Gman project, right? So blank slate, I have a new project that I want to create. I would fire up the command line. Like I said, I'm going to start with the command line, then we'll go to GUI, um, desktop, and then we'll go to web. So if this is scary, just open up, you know, fades or solitaire or something, and we'll get to that. Um, so this is command line. So I, I want to create a new folder on my hard drive. I make the gman directory. I cd into that gman directory, and I type git init. And all that does is simply says, OK, I initiated a new git repository in this directory. I will start looking for changes in this directory, and I'll know that this directory is called gman. Um, once you have that, you have a git repository. There's no server involved. Uh, there's no place I need to push. That's all I really have to do. The other way I can do that is let's say we already have Gman, right? You want to contribute to my Gman project. You would just, once you have Gman installed, just type git clone and the URL to Gman. GitHub, uh, Git will say, okay, I know how to get that. It'll clone everything down. It'll do some math in the background. Uh, and now you have a Gman folder on your hard drive that you can move into. You can use that software directly. You can make changes to that software. You can vendor that into something else. And these are files on your hard drive, just as if you downloaded them in Internet Explorer or Chrome. Um, they're actually real, real files. So Git clone and Git init are the two kind of basic ways to get stuff on your computer uh, and create a Git instance. Um, the next kind of basic thing to look at is Git status. Git status does exactly what you think it does. It says, what's going on in this Git repository right now? So if I haven't made any changes and I type git status, it'll tell me nothing's changed. You're on the master branch. There's nothing to do here. Everything's clean. Let's say I add a file. I call it foo.markdown. I type git status again. And it's going to tell me now that on master, there are untracked changes in, in foo.markdown. It's going to be big and red. And that's what that is Git telling me. Uh, OK, there's this file here called foo.markdown. I have no idea what it's doing here. I have, don't know anything about it. What would you like me to do? So git status should give you a quick heads up about what the, uh, what's going on in your project, what git knows about, and what git doesn't know about. And we'll see that again in a second. The next cool thing is git diff, which is kind of a slightly more advanced version of git status. Git diff compares what you currently have in your folder, what you're currently working with, um, to things that it knew previously about. So if I, have, if I type the word bar into foo.markdown. I type git status. I see foo.markdown has been notified. I type git diff, and it tells me in the last line there that I added the word bar to foo.markdown. So git diff creates a difference between what git knows about and what currently exists in my folder. Um, and this can, again, can, this could be across 30 files. It could be across images. It could be across anything you want. And you notice it says that it's modified now and not added. OK, so we got our file, foo.markdown, that we want to add to the Gman project. Uh, we've added the word bar to it. We no verified that, that Git knows the files there. But we need to tell it now that we actually want it to track this file, add this file to this project. Uh, and as you might have guessed, it's as simple as doing git add. So I do git add foo.markdown. Uh, and now when I do git status, it's in green. And it says there's one change that's staged to be committed. Um, so this is a kind of a, a, a tricky concept that took me a while to understand, especially if you're coming from centralized version control. In Git, there's two stages to making a change. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to, well, actually, you have to actually make the change. So the zeroth thing you have to do is actually make the change, right? So you actually create the file and add the content to it. The first thing you need to do is you need to do git add, which stages that change. It says, OK, hey, git, I'd like you to know about this file. Keep track of these changes. Remember that I made this change. Uh, and the second thing you then have to do is what's called git commit. 
Um, git commit is actually the thing that, that pushes that change into the directory. It takes those, or into the repository. It takes those, sta sta those stage changes and it actually saves them. So uh, if I had already done git add, I do git status, it says changes waiting to be committed, stage to be committed, or food at markdown. I type git commit minus m, added some content to food at markdown. It says, OK, one file change with one insertion, and now that's added. And if I do git status again, git says, OK, there's no changes that have been made since the last file was added. So git status to see what's up, git diff to see the exact change, um, git add to stage that change, and then git commit um, to save that change, kind of doing control S or file save in your favorite um, text editor. We can then also go and do git log. So I just made a change. We just added this file to uh, my gman. And now, as a reminder, this is our local gman instance that we either created locally or that we cloned down. No changes have been made to, to the master gman instance. Nothing's been gone up on the internet. And if I do git log, I can now see added some content to foo.markdown to the foo file is now the latest thing in the log. We can see adding foo.markdown as a commit I made before that. And um, we can see some prior history within the project, who made what change when. That's the fundamental magic secret sauce of Git right there, and you can expose it through Git log. There's all sorts of cool hacks that you can do to make that look fancy and have graphics and all sorts of stuff that I'm glad to talk about more and share my file with you. Next, we need to push that back up to the server, right? So in this instance, we'll, clay, we'll pretend that uh, I have my own copy of Gman or I have a fork of Gman, which we'll get to in a second what exactly that means. But it's as simple as Git push. So I have my change, I added it, I committed it, I do git push, and git says, OK, great, I will now send this up to the server and push this back up to GitHub for other people to get that change, and they can pull it down. That's the mean mark transferring code between DC and, and Philadelphia, git push. And last, uh, now if Mark needs to then pull that change down, he's like, oh man, I really need that foo.markdown file. That's going to be a really awesome change. My entire life depends on it. He would just do git pull. Um, and here I'm being explicit. I say git pull origin master, which is saying pull from the main version that's sitting on GitHub. Uh, and as you can see, it pulls it down. And then it says, OK, I'm adding the foo.markdown file. One file changed, one insertion, creating file foo. So git push, git pull, put it up on the server, pulled it back down. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the nicer, friendlier, smiley face, rainbow interfaces uh, is branching. Um, so you can think of branching as kind of, everyone's seen the movie uh, Back to the Future? Yeah? So in Back to the Future, they get that like sports almanac and then Biff gets a hold of it. And they create an alternate 1985 in which Biff is mayor of Hill Valley, right? You can think of branching as kind of alternate timelines. What if this had happened? Um, and so in Git, we have the concept of branching. Uh, the reason we have that is if two people are working on the same software project, we want them to be able to work on disparate things without having to coordinate with each other. Right? They should be able to work in the same file, work in different files, change all sorts of files. Um, and so the way you do that is you create your own branch. Uh, usually these are descriptively named feature branches. So in this case, my branch might have been add the foo file. Uh, or if I'm fixing a bug, it might be, you know, change the sidebar to blue or something like that. Um, and that would allow me to do a complete separate history. So I can have uh, several commits in that separate history, work all on my own. I can push it up to the server. And that doesn't affect anything that anyone else is doing uh, until you merge it back in. So the way you can make it create a branch, so if I'm just in my normal command line git, and I type git branch, it's going to tell me that I'm on the master branch. That's the primary branch, just like it sounds like. If I type git branch and then the name of a branch, it'll actually create that branch for me. Uh, and if I do git checkout and the name of that branch, it'll move me over to that branch. Once I've checked out that branch, um, this is something that can be a little bit daunting for people that are new to, to version control. I know it took me a while for myself. Uh, once you've checked out that branch, you can make any changes you want. They're, very, they're, they're throwawayable. You can spend an hour on it. You can spend 20 minutes on it. Um, and it's very easy to kind of just quickly hack on something. What would this look like um, in your own little space? Let's think of it like a sandbox, a code sandbox. Um, and then uh, do I have another line in there? Uh, yeah, and then the last line there is I did, then did git branch again. Once I was on the foo branch, it'll show me that there's a master branch and a foo branch, and I'm on the master branch. I'm in this kind of alternate universe in which Biff is mayor of Hillsdale, not the, or Hill Valley. Not that anyone would want that, but just in case. It's a very sad ending if that was the happened. Um, the other thing I can do is then git merge. So if I already did my git branch and I'm on the foo branch, I can add a file. I can commit that file. So I'm adding bar.markdown, git status, git add, git commit. And I have this now file, I have this other commit that's sitting on the foo branch. Right? If I go back to the master branch, uh, I can then do git merge foo, or bar, what I call it, foo. Git merge foo, 
Uh, and that will all of a sudden then merge that commit that was sitting in that other branch back into master. It's a little bit silly in this particular example where we only have one commit on that other branch. Um, but imagine if that was 30 commits, or 50 commits, or 100 commits. Uh, or maybe it was commits by a bunch of different authors. Uh, maybe it was an upgrade to a new version of a uh, framework, or an upgrade to a new version of a, um, um, uh, a, a, a content management system, or something like that. That's something you'd want to do out in a separate branch so you can test it, maybe test it around locally before you, before you deploy it. So branching um, is used for collaboration, but just think about them as alternate universes, alternate timelines that all have their own alternate history, but can also be easily merged back together. When you go back to the original 1985 and prevent Biff from getting the old Mac. That joke's not working. Okay, good. I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm, I'm a really big fan of Back to the Future. Um, okay, so everything I just said, if you didn't like that, feel free to forget it. You do not need to know a single line of any of that in order to contribute to open source. And everyone's like, throws it on their pen, right? Um, so the great thing about uh, open source and the great thing about version control is that in the past, I'd say five, ten years or so, is technology has made it easier to work together than it is to work alone, right? Technology is pushing up to the tipping point where you don't need to have a computer science degree. You don't need to do that super intimidating black background green text to get involved with open source. So this is Git via desktop, and I'm going to do that same exact thing we just did. There, done, right? So I have a foo file. I used my favorite text editor. Um, I added that foo file. I fire up. Um, GitHub for Mac. Um, um, this is a Mac. If you have a PC, it's a very similar interface uh, where it says, type your summary here. I type adding foo.markdown and hit commit. It takes care of everything for me. I can see at the bottom, I, I have unsync commits and foo.markdown. It adds it. And that's, that's right there, my, my git status, my git add, and git commit all in one click right there. Makes things a lot, a lot easier. But it's helpful to kind of have some of this background, some of this history. Um, and if you're spending time in command line anyways, like I often do, I prefer to use the command interface. Uh, and if we want to do that same kind of git push, git pull, um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to click the sync button in the top right corner. It takes care of everything else for you. So that's, that's, that's an idea of that all this kind of stuff can happen behind the background with all the, all the need for all that command line com complexity. And all of a sudden you can start to see this workflow can be used not just for coders, not just for people with computer science degrees, but designers, program managers, project managers, people that write documentation, accessibility experts that can go through and start making changes to, to files, maybe prose files, um, and can just kind of add it, commit it, sync it, all with one or two clicks. Now, if you don't like that, everything I just said you can forget again. The cool thing about the internet is that it exists. Um, you can do ev almost everything now that you could do via command line or via the, web inter the desktop interface. You can now do entirely through the web. Um, if you see a file on GitHub and you want to make a change to it, you click the edit button, you make your change, you hit commit. It's all through the a web interface. Um, no code required, nothing to download required. Um, it's a little bit more cumbersome. Obviously, I would not write an entire you know, WordPress plugin or Drupal module entirely through the web interface. Um, but if you're collaborating on documentation, it's really, really easy and really, really great to get people involved. So the most basic building block of, of code on GitHub, on the web, is the organization. Um, so organizations are exactly what they sound like. Think of them similar to an organization in the real world, in your own city, your own, your own state. Um, here just as an example, I use the, the city of Philadelphia. So this would be github.com slash city of Philadelphia, very creatively named. Um, and you can see the, the members of the organization over here on the right. Um, you can see some information about them in the middle. And then here are their projects uh, on, on towards the bottom that would continue to scroll through a page or two. Uh, think of this roughly analogously to a Facebook page or a Facebook profile for an organization. Um, organizations do not have their own login. They're kind of meta entities that individual users, individual members um, will have access to and can have different permissions for. So this is our Philadelphia organization. Um, and the basic building block of code on GitHub or within Git is the repository. Repository, think of it like a project or a folder that just maintains a discrete piece of code. Um, and you can have, for, like I said, if you're doing open source, you can have as many repositories as you want. Um, I think the, the winner right now, there's one, one organization that has about 50,000 repositories all open source. Um, so you can, do, you can do as many as you want. It actually works, works for the most part pretty, pretty well. Um, and so here's an example of Philadelphia put out uh, where to get flu shots. So last uh, September or so, November, uh, Philadelphia was like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, 
People outside of Philadelphia, last time I checked, I was reading the New York Times, and people outside of Philadelphia also get the flu. Um, why should we build an application just specific to Philadelphia or a data format just specific to Philadelphia um, when this is a global problem, right? The, the cool thing about open source and government, and I think the biggest argument for open source and government, is that there, there's no com competition, right? It's not like Coke and Pepsi, where if Coke puts out a mechanism to publish a blog post, and Pepsi comes out and just like takes that mechanism, that affects the bottom line, that lowers their overhead. Um, if the city of Chicago puts out a mechanism to publish a press release, and uh, you know Green Bay comes along and takes that, other than football, there's no competition. We're all on the same team here. We all want to make government better. Um, so that's what Philadelphia did. They put out a spec for how, where to get a flu shot this past fall. Um, and the cool thing about it is then New York and San Francisco came, no, Chicago and San Francisco came along and were able to take that same thing. So if I'm a civic entrepreneur, I'm a, a, a mobile developer, I can just make an application once and all of a sudden it works everywhere. Whoop, I dropped my power cord. Technical difficulties. So there we go. Uh, and so the cool thing. So this is just the idea of this is what a repository, what a project, the basic building block. That would be our Git repository. Um, we saw Gman earlier. Um, and then inside each repository, there are files, right? Just as you would have on your computer. Uh, and the cool thing about GitHub is certain files are magic files that automatically render. So if you upload an image file, you can see it. If you upload a markdown file, it gets rendered into HTML. CSV files render into tables. Map files render into maps. So here you can see the flu shot specification. And this is all in version control. So I can go through and see who made what change when, when changes were made, and can go back or forward at any point in time. Well, probably not forward in time from now, but theoretically, I can go back or forward at any point in time. Again, the Back to the Future references, the, 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 hits, the hits keep coming. Um, back or forward at any point in time and see um, kind of the pedigree of the data to make sure it's valid. Uh, not to mention the cool thing about putting data up here is once it's in an open source kind of version control format, if I got a flu shot someplace that's not on this map, I can submit a proposed change. I can submit a pull request to make that change or open an issue at least and say, hey, like, I got my flu shot here. It was sketchy. It came on the back of a truck, but I got my flu shot here. Um, you, should, you should let me do that. So here's an example of an issue. Um, Mark wanted to add details about which vaccine type, right? And so the difference here in, in this could be from someone inside the organization. This could be from me, Joe Public. This could be from a constituent within the city of Philadelphia. Um, the cool thing about this that compares to the normal traditional government workflow um, is if I want to know about a government agency's data, if I have a question, if I want to know if they can put data out, if I have a question about their API, um, I generally email data at agency.gov or newmedia at agency.gov. And that's a very one-way street. It's me talking directly to a, a program manager, to a project manager, to a developer. Um, but the kind of problems people have aren't usually all that unique. It's, is this table month, day, year, or year, month, day? What's the format of this column? Do you have this data? I think you should make the sidebar blue. I'm blind and I can't access this page. That kind of information can be surfaced publicly. There's nothing proprietary about that. Um, so putting those issues out into the open um, allows you to kind of have that conversation in the open. I can come along and say, oh, this is really great. I'm a doctor. Um, my, I can only recommend my patients get the nasal version of the vaccine. Um, if you can you know, put that in there, that would really help me in my medical practice. Right? So putting things out in the open, um, not making it so it's a broadcast model, but making the government the center of a broad community of people dedicated to solving challenges around that data. So forks are the, the second kind of somewhat um, difficult to explain topic, um, but think of a fork as my own version of your project, right? So I told you earlier, I have my Gman project out there. It's github.com slash benbalter slash Gman. Uh, and you want to grab that and you want to make some changes to it. Maybe you only care about the Canadian uh, government organizations. Uh, maybe you have four uh, your own city's organization that you'd like to add. Uh, and so you can make a fork of that. In the top right corner of every page, here, let me go back one so you can see. Um, uh, what's the easiest way to do it? Okay, here. So I'm on, the, I'm on the flu shot page. The top right corner of every page, there's a big fork button. I can click that fork button and somewhat instantly, I'll have a copy in my own account, right? I'll, it'll, it'll then be um, github.com slash bob slash gman, github.com slash benbalter slash flu shot spec. And that's my own copy. That's the same thing as me kind of cloning it down onto my hard drive. I can make any changes I want to that. I can delete everything. I can add anything. Um, and that's mine. The note, that doesn't affect anybody else. So that's, the, that's what a fork is. Once you have a fork, and this is where the magic of open source comes in, once you have a fork, I can then take those changes that I made. So I took Gman. 
I made some changes to it in my fork that is mine to own. And I want you to then pull those changes back into your version, the canonical version. Same thing as if you contribute to WordPress to Drupal, to Joomla, to jQuery. Um, so here's an example of a citizen came along. The White House published its open data policy, Project Open Data, uh, last May on GitHub as kind of a collaborative document. So here we're just dealing with text just to make things easier. And a citizen came along, a subject matter expert, and said, hey, I really think you should add a link to the Link Data Working Group as an example of an additional resource. Uh, and he put this out in the open. I commented. I mentioned some other people that maybe they should come take a look. Um, and here is the entire change that he made. So like I said, that's public. That has a URL. That's going to exist forever. Here's the change he made. It's a little bit hard to see on the screen. This last line right here, line 159, he just added that line. right? And everyone can see the exact change he made, who made what change when. And we can compare that across versions um, and across time. This is the conversation that came out of that one line change. Because you have people really passionate in the community that care about making the government better. When you do things out in the open, um, and this is things people that are all directly affected by this. Imagine if you're the stakeholder, you don't have time to field this many emails about one, a stupid one line change to add a resource, um, let alone do these people have the ability to talk to each other, to have that ongoing dialogue. Um, so it actually ended up being a really, really substantive conversation. I think there are about 160 comments here or so by about 40, 45 people, um, government employees, members of nonprofits like the Sunlight Foundation. And it was a very interesting discussion on the merits of linked data, which doesn't matter what that is. But the idea is you can tap directly into subject matter experts. This could have been accessibility. This could have been any of a, a million different topics. So you saw that they submitted that pull request. Then when the White House comes along, they just have a big green button or a little red button. They can close the pull request and say, thank you very much. I don't think we should make that change. Um, or they can click the green button. They can merge that pull request and say, thank you very much for your contribution. I think that's a great idea. Um, so we had that huge, big 160, line, 160 comment thread. And then Haley Van Dyke from the White House comes along and says, thanks for this great discussion. I love the suggestion. I'm going to go ahead and merge that in. And so you can see she closed that out on May 20th, 2013. It got its own little commit ID. And that's now part of the history of the project. Any place, you know, archaeology just 20 years from now can come through and look at the Rosetta Stone that is GitHub and see on May 20th that Haley made that change and link back to this discussion with the merits of that entire change that then happened out in the public. And the project's better as a result. Uh, the other kind of secret sauce that you see that's going on here is mentions. Um, just like on Twitter or on Facebook, you can magically mention anybody on GitHub, anyone in the world, and they get brought into the conversation instantly. So it's a really great way to bring subject matter experts in. Um, and then just to bring everything full circle, uh, if we go back to the change log, remember I ran that git log command a little bit earlier. This is that same exact command happening on GitHub. Uh, as you can see, it's a lot easier. It's a lot more linkable. Um, I got some emoji in there now. Uh, and so it's a lot more friendly version of an interface. So the what we just saw there, the same exact process happening in three different ways with a little bit of jargon. Um, command line, desktop, web, three flavors. Not quite 31 flavors, three flavors. But you're welcome to choose your own as long as it's one of those three. Good so far. Anything that I, that I glossed over that I should double down on that Go the board. OK, sweet. Sounds good. Good feedback. All right, so that's the, the, the jargony technical stuff. Um, I'd love to talk more about the more soft side of things, about getting involved with open source, either as a consumer or as a producer for government-specific concerns. And then I'll finish up um, before the Q&A with some talks, thoughts about um, government open uh, government community building or open, open source community building. Um, so the first question that I often get asked is, OK, I want to consume open source software. We're currently using um, you know, a, a open source CMS. How do I know if this plugin is good? Uh, or, hey, I want to use this jQuery plugin. How do I know if that's a good plugin? Um, there's a couple of little like, uh, milestones, little flags that you can look at. Um, the first and, and most obvious is update frequency. Right? So not only how, frequency is, how frequently is it updated. Is it updated once a year, once a month? Um, but when was it last updated? Right? Was it updated a week ago? Was it updated two years ago? Um, issues. This one oftentimes, you know, especially in government, we think of issues and we think of it a bad thing. Like, oh my god, this project has 10,000 issues. Um, for me, issues are a really great thing. And they're an analog or a proxy for how many people care about this project. Right? If I see a project with zero issues, I don't think, oh my god, this is a perfect project. This is a perfect piece of software. We've done it software 
software developers, we can stop, we've made ultimate perfect software. That doesn't exist. Um, you need to see issues there, and the more issues you see, the better, because that means there are more eyes on the software, there's a direction the software is heading. Forks, stars, watchers, downloads, every platform has a different metric for this, um, but just some sort of metric that gauges the popularity. Um, I come from the WordPress world where you can see the graph over time of how many downloads the plugins have gotten. Drupal is something similar. On GitHub we have forks and stars. Any sort of metric or uh, objective metric that shows just who cares about the software is a great way. Um, kind of on the software side of things, documentation. Is it documented at all? Is the document in a nice format? Do they have their own documentation website? Is there a marketing website? Um, who is behind the software project? Is it, is it Kevin in his mom's basement? Or is it you know, a government agency that's built this software? Number of contributors, who else uses it? Right, Is another agency using this? Um, the license, right? is this project licensed at all? Is it under a license that your agency is allowed to use? Um, and last, and sometimes it's a little bit harder for government, but it's sometimes worth spending the extra five, ten dollars uh, and having a, a technical expert actually look at the code. Is it commented well? Um, is it you know, written modern development standards? Is it you know, written in CRAN? What does the code itself look like. On the other side of that is if you yourself want to get involved in an open source project, um, what does is, what is your team look like? What, what kind of um, framework do you need within your, your agency? Um, and the first thing is an open development process, right? It's really, really hard. You get a lot of cognitive dissonance if your organization internally is a very, very closed sourced organization and all of a sudden you're like, and we're going to use an open source CMS and we're going to contribute to open source software even though that's nothing we've ever done and not how we work otherwise. Um, so as much as possible, even as a baby step, try to take some of the these ideas and bring them inside your organization. Maybe you're not on GitHub, but maybe we have, you have a shared issue tracker in a Google document, in a spreadsheet that anyone in your organization, anyone within your state can, can see. Um, if you're going to an outside developer, um, ask to see their track record. Have they contributed to other open source projects? Let me see some GitHub repos or, or some you know, Drupal modules that you've built in the past to see that they can speak the language of open source and they get open source. Because um, successful open source projects have technical experts, have um, consultants, have developers that, that breathe, sleep, and eat the open source community and can kind of be your open source Sherpa throughout the process. Um, if you're contracting for that, oftentimes, especially on the federal side, you contract in the original procurement so that your developer um, has to do things in the open or has to like work with you and consult with you to do things in the open. Um, do things open from day one. It's really, really hard to spend six months, six years building something and then open source it. Um, uh, is there security issues? There's privacy issues? Maybe you weren't thinking about open source originally, documentation. Uh, it's a lot, a lot easier if you start something open source from day one. Um, 18F, the new kind of startup within GSA, has been doing this. They're rebuilding the FEC website, the Federal Elections Commission, um, for where you get information about who's spending money on what, or SEC, SEC. Securities, I don't even know. The one that does with fin finance money. Let's go FEC, the remember you see, right? Um, and they were redesigning the website. And so rather than the traditional way to do things was to go in a room with a whiteboard and like do wireframes and everything being closed to kind of you had to be there. So the big mahogany room with leather chairs. Um, they're doing everything out in the open. So they opened up a GitHub issue with the wireframes and users of the website, like you talk about cheap usability testing, users of the website are commenting on those wireframes as they're being developed and they're continuing that process as they start to choose a framework, as they start to, to put individual lines of code, design mockups, everything happening out in the open. And there's not an open sourcing after that. It just already is open source. Shipping things at 0 0.1 and not 1.0. Um, being the matter of in government, they love things to be perfect, right? If it can't go out the door, if it has a typo, because then like people won't trust the government. Um, in open source, and especially on GitHub, the community norm is very much that you will make mistakes. You are human, and that's why you're here. We want to talk to you human to human. Um, and so as much as possible, put things out there, but make sure to manage expectations, both internally and externally, that what you're putting out is a beta. It is 0 0.1, and you're building towards 1.0, but you want the community's help to do that. Get the community on your side, so they're not like at the door with pitchforks and, and torches. Um, and the last thing is to have an open source stack. Right? It is possible to contribute to open source software if you're using Cold Fusion or ASP.NET. It's a lot easier to contribute to open source software if you're already kind of baked into an open source passionate community. If you can go to the WordPress meetups, the Joomla meetups, the Drupal meetups, and have someone hold your hand and kind of answer some questions for you. So what I mean by that is this might be a typical closed source stack. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's in many instances in which you need closed source software. My laptop is a piece of closed source software. Um, but this might be a typical government server stack. 
Um, everything on the top the, the, or on the bottom, depending on which way you look at it, the, op the operating server itself, the server, the database, the language with some arguability, um, might all be closed source things. Or maybe one piece in there might be somewhat open source. And then you get to your site, and you're like, OK, even though everything up until this point is closed source, we're going to do open source totally possible to do. It's just going to be an uphill battle. Compare and contrast that with something like this, where you have a completely open source stack. This is a typical LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. This might be you running WordPress or Drupal on it. And now all of a sudden, when you go to put that plugin out, when you go to put that module out, when you go to open source your theme uh, to share it with another government organization, another the next town over, there's already a community there looking to welcome you, looking to help you, uh, looking to hold your hand through the process. There's already that repository. There's already documentation. So having an open source stack, having open source team thinking open source from day one. Um, it's not just open source, like I say, open source isn't a verb. It's not flipping a light switch. It's not we were closed source and now we are open source. It's a philosophy. It's a workflow. And as much of the process as you can make open as possible, um, it's, it's, it's going to help you out a lot. Um, and and one, one caveat to add to all this. I've been talking about open source. There's no reason you can't take all of these philosophies and do them internally, do them behind your firewall. Um, there's no reason you can't say, OK, anyone that has, you know, that has a reason to have access to the software, or anyone that can has a, have access to the software, has access to the sof software source code. Even if they're not a developer, the ability to open up issues, to see what the project roadmap is, to be able to comment on discussions, um, you can do that internally. And coming from government, it's uh, in, in, uh, very, very helpful. I, I, when I worked at a government agency, they're the people at the next desk over. We were basically working on the same exact project. We didn't know that because we had no way to kind of have that discussion because we were in different you know, organizational units. Uh, as soon as we got um, GitHub, it was like, oh, wait, you're working on a widget, Twitter widget too? Like, I need a Twitter widget. Why don't we just you know, combine forces? Um, so the, the last part of this I want to talk about is open source governance. So a lot of people think that um, they come from the Wikipedia model, model where uh, once you're open source, like, it's wild west. Anyone can change anything, and they're going to have like swear words in your code and bugs and insecurity or whatever. Well, depending on your developers, you might have swear words, but most likely in the commit history, but it's a different story. Um, so in, in open source, we talk about the founder of the project. The person that made the software uh, is the BDFL, the Benevolent Dictator for Life, which is seen as a very, very good thing. Um, it says, you gave me this software, um, but as a result, you're kind of like my mom or dad. You get the because I say so argument anytime you, you, you need it. Uh, and you can think about that if you're the creator of a piece of software, you're the government agency, the organization behind that software, you're the BDFL. You're putting it out there. Other people might have opinions on what color the sidebar should be or how big the widget should be. But at the end of the day, it's your choice. Um, but you also have to be benevolent about it. You have to listen to opinions and try to create a community as much as possible. Um, below that, you have collaborators. Collaborators are generally people either within your organization, maybe contractors, maybe people from the public that have a strong history of contributing to your project that you say, hey, you've been doing a great job. Thank you very much. I'd like you to be, have a leadership position within our uh, open source community. Uh, and I would like you to be able to merge pull requests, to be able to comment on issues, and have a little bit more of a status. Think of them somewhat as manager management levels, middle management, you know, um, where they, they serve as an interface between you and the open source community, especially if you're kind of new to the open source world. Um, they can be that Sherpa and can take a lot of the weight off your shoulders. Next down the line is contributors. Exactly what you think they are. These are everyday users, uh, are accessibility experts, content experts, subject matter experts that continue can contribute code, design, um, and they submit that to you as a proposed change for you to accept or reject. Um, and last is obviously users. You can't ignore the users. You need to get them engaged in some way. Um, everyday users might not be going over to the GitHub issue tracker, but there are things like um, uh, user voice or things that you can have voting systems or just some sort of feedback mechanisms you're engaging them in the development process as well. Uh, open source licensing, if, if is this something that's interesting that's, that's worth talking about? Or I know it's different people are at different levels. OK, sweet. Um, the best single piece of advice, if you take one thing away about open source licensing, is take a look at choosealicense.com. Um, choosealicense.com is an open source website that goes through the p most popular, I'd say, probably 30 or 40 licenses or so, um, and just categorizes in plain, simple English, red light, green light, what you can and can't do with it. Um, when you are building software in-house, uh, if you're building it yourself or if you're contracting out to an outside developer, um, have that conversation up front about the intellectual property rights. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, the contractor made the software, so we can't open source it. Um, every contractor that I've met, with the exception of maybe one or two, would love their software to be open source. It's free advertising. 
right? They get, if they're proud of their software, they get to show the world what great software they're building. And oftentimes, especially with government contracting, they can't disclose that they're a government contractor otherwise or what work they've done. Um, so it's something that they can link to and add to their portfolio. And it's not just a screenshot of the website, uh, but it's the entire you know, actual code to the, to the project. So talk to your contractors, talk to your in-house developers, um, either up front or after it's out the door, chances are they'll, want, they'll be more than glad to open source it. There's two kind of models there. Um, either they can open source it and they can maintain it in their own account, which is kind of less popular but easier on the government, um, or they can give you the rights as a government organization that you would then open source it under some sort of an open source license. Um, the modern trend in open source licensing is to put the, what's called the CC0 license, the Creative Commons Zero license. Um, what that says is I want nothing to do with this code, but don't sue me, is essentially what it says. It says you can do anything you want with this. Um, I, disclo I, I disclaim all rights and all um, responsibilities I have this code. Do whatever you want, just don't, don't blame me if something, something goes wrong. The reason for that is technology is increasingly being used for the delivery of citizen services. If you have an open source voting machine, I, as a, I need to know and be able to verify that that voting machine is doing what it says it's supposed to be doing and not you know, voting for Susan every third vote. Um, so putting things out under the least restrictive open source license possible um, allows me as a citizen to, to verify that, um, but also make sure that there's nothing in between me and the laws and the citizen services that are being delivered. The one kind of caveat to that though is what are called copyleft licenses. So Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, which I've been using as examples because they're obviously very popular in this space, um, they're under what's called the GPL license, new public license, um, which says that if you build anything on my code, you also have to release it under the GPL, um, which there's nothing wrong with government releasing a project under GPL uh, as long as the government is releasing it in the least restrictive way that they're legally allowed to. Um, the, I can go into much more detail. I'm, I'm glad to geek out about this. I got to say, I'm not your lawyer. So so please talk to your own lawyers about this. I am a lawyer, but not your lawyer. Um, talk to your lawyers about this. But uh, in, in short, like the contributors to WordPress own the copyright to the code of WordPress. They then license to you as a government or as an individual that you can use this code for whatever you like under the condition that you also license it under this same license. So the government organization then can't turn around and license that under CC0 or MIT because they don't have the rights to do that. Just as if you buy GIS data or you know, some sort of other uh, data source that you don't have the license to put out on a uh, more restrict or less restrictive way. Least restrictive license, ideally CC0, uh, if not GPL. Uh, and if ever in doubt, choose a license.com. It's an excellent, excellent resource. Um, that, that GitHub maintains, but that's completely open source and kind of crowdsourced within the community and has some, some government specific stuff as well. Uh, last thing is open source security. A lot of this is just kind of um, FUD, uh, often f fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, a lot of people will say that open source is less secure. Um, I've actually found in my experience that it tends to be more secure because you're, you actually see kind of how the sausage is made. You're not doing what's called security through obscurity. If I know that there's not a, I can tell that there's not a back door in there. I can tell that intellectually that that lock is a secure lock. Um, but also there's kind of examples because you have this crowdsourced distribution, there's no profit motive. Release cycles are a lot faster. Um, there's been some famous bugs in major enterprise software like Adobe products that have existed for, for months or years because like version 2 is coming out. We can't release version 1.9.7 because version 2 is coming out and that's going to screw up the upgrade release cycle. Uh, whereas one of my favorite stories is WordPress got a bug report and they, somebody emailed security at wordpress.com or .org. They got the patch through and within two hours uh, the, uh, the, there was a new version of WordPress already put out because they had somebody that was awake at that 2 in the morning in you know halfway around the world or whatever it might be. Um, not to mention WordPress has some cool things, auto updates now that a lot of other people are getting into. Um, the, the last thing on this is treat code as foreign code, right? So you probably have some sort of procedure within your, your organization uh, if you want to bring open source code into your organization, be it a WordPress plugin, a Drupal module, Joomla piece, a code. Um, it's your code that you write should be no different, right? Code that sits outside the firewall, that sits on GitHub, that sits in another Git server. Treat as open source code that's in the open source community just like everything else. And do code reviews uh, as, as code reviews. So you should have your security team on those, those, those code reviews, on those pull requests, just as your developers are doing code reviews along, alongside of it. It's a lot easier to review one line of code at a time than it is to review 3,000 thousand lines of code at a time. Um, and the last argument that I'd make if your security people give you any pushback is that it's not a threat until it hits production, right? I can have a thing in a piece of, of software that we're running, but a different version of it sitting someplace else is like, and email me all the passwords. 
It's not until that actually hits production that it's a security threat. Um, and because things are out in the open, it's a lot harder for things to get snuck in. Um, Git itself has what's called um, cryptographic integrity checking, so that somebody can't kind of sneak something like that in without you knowing. It'll throw a big error at you and say, no, no, something's wrong here. This, this does not check out. It doesn't pass the sniff test. Good on that, just kind of basic over the ground rules for kind of like best practices of glad to geek out about that more, but that's, there's a lot to cover there, but that was last. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is community engagement. So we have this, we, we committed our code, we got this great open source project, we've avoided all the common follies and, and done all the best practices for, for government open source. How do we actually grow communities around these shared challenges? The first and most important thing is to have one class of developers. That means you have one bug tracker. Um, a, a lot of people will have, you know, use Pivotal Tracker internally, uh, and they'll use GitHub externally or Jira or whatever it might be. If I, as a developer, as an open source developer, a community developer, don't have access to your bug tracker, and there's that information imbalance, it's going to create a really, really bad experience for me. Um, imagine this: inside your bug tracker, you have that next sprint. Uh, you're going to fix, you know, the bug with the the submit button. Right? And I, as an open source developer, try to go submit something, I like submit a pothole request, and it doesn't work. The submit button doesn't work on mobile. And so I spend my entire weekend, I'm very glad to, because I really want that pothole fixed outside my house, and I submit, I fix the mobile submit button, and I submit that to you as a pull request, and you say, oh, thanks for this, but we're already on this. We've been working on this for six months. We got this going to be awesome. We got this fixed. I'm never going to contribute to that project ever again. Right? When you have that information imbalance, you make me feel like I'm just free labor. I'm not part of the project. I'm not part of the solution. Um, I'm just here to give you free code. And that's, that's not a really great experience for developers. So as much as possible, try to make sure that there's a balance between, on both sides of the firewall in terms of information sharing and also input. Right? If you're having lots of meet space discussions, like uh, discussions in physical space rooms, minimize those as much as possible. If that's part of your workflow, great. Memorialize them as much as possible. Put your notes online in part of the project and say, hey, we had a sprint planning meeting. We planned the next six months of this project. Um, here's where we'd like to take the project. Please give us your thoughts and give the opportunity for the community to give you feedback. Which leads into communicating the big picture. Um, a lot of times you'll see a software project that will just have like one line, which is the title of the software project, and that's it. Um, a as a developer, I want to get behind a problem, right? If you think back to the uh, Obama presidential campaign, it wasn't, yes, we did. Right? It was, yes, we can. And you kind of got to paint that picture of where you want the project to go and where you want to take things. Um, I like to talk about that as open sourcing problems, not open sourcing the solutions. So what are the goals of the project? I make a, a purpose to have at least one line, usually a paragraph, for every project I open source that says, this is what the project is here for. Think of it like your project's constitution. Um, it's been a very helpful, especially if you get into kind of like flame wars with, with people, or if somebody else wants to take the project in a different direction, you can say, look, the point of this project is x. If you want to do Y, that's totally fine. You have two options. Either A, fork the project and do your own thing elsewhere, or B, submit a pull request to the readme file, and let's change the goal of the process and have a project and have a discussion about changing the goal of the project. Um, but, but this right now is the goal of the project. What's your vision? Where do you want to take things? What's the roadmap? What's the timeline? All those documents you have internally. Do you only have budget through the end of the fiscal year? Right? If I contribute to this, is this going to be a dead project in six months? And also the project status. If you put out source code and it's no longer maintained, let me know that it's no longer maintained. If it's kind of just a hobby project on the weekends, let me know it's a hobby project. And I think most importantly, if it's a production quality, you use this every day, people's lives depend on this, you can use this for your stupid project, let me know that in the readme, that this is something that you're behind and something that, that you care about. Um, it's kind of kind of silly to actually have to say this, but most projects don't do this. Actually, encourage contrib contributors. Um, in, in open source, it's kind of assumed that you should be able to contribute, but in government, that's not necessarily the case. A lot of time, government does what's called source disclosed, meaning here's the source code, but it's just there. I'm not accepting any pull requests. So if you'd like contributors, A, encourage me to contribute. I get a warm, fuzzy feeling when my like, local city says, we'd like your help making our city better. Right? That's why I, as a civic hacker, want to help you. Um, but tell me how to contribute. Should I submit a pull request? Should I email you? Maybe I've never contributed on this strange, magical platform before. Um, maybe I'm not a developer, right? How do I, how do I, how, what, how do I actually contribute? 
Um, provide feedback and acknowledgement. Once I do contribute, if you say, like, give me a thumbs up emoji and a palm tree and say, thank you very much for your contribution, I get a really warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Um, requirements. How do I actually contribute? Does this thing run in Ruby? Is it run in PHP? How do I run this locally to test my change before I send it to you? Um, and last is automated testing, which will help you a lot, especially as a non-technical person. Um, automated testing, anytime a proposed change comes in, it can run through one test, it can run through thousands of tests, um, and it'll give you a big green light if, it, if everything works, or a big red light if it's going to break things. Really, really great to have some confidence uh, and accept pull requests in the public a little bit more quickly. The um, last bit about governance is, whenever possible, decentralize especially technical decision making to technical decision makers. Uh, so I mentioned earlier the White House's We the People, um, the, the, project open, sorry, the, White, the White House's Project Open Data, the White House Open Data Policy. If I submit a pull request to Project Open Data, it doesn't have to go up to like President Barack Obama to be like, well, Ben submitted a pull request today. I can, no, you decentralize it as much as possible so that the coders can make the technical decisions about the code and policy people can make policy decisions about the, the broader scope of the project. If you have a contractor, empower them to do technical reviews. Make that part of your contract. Um, if you have coders in-house, make sure that they feel confident enough to do that uh, and move as quickly as possible. And the other side of that is pushing value back up the, the, the chain, right? Make sure your boss has something to know um, that, that he's part of the picture or she's part of the picture that she can contribute. Maybe that's as simple as giving them a five-minute tutorial about how to look at open issues and see what's being solved. Maybe that's adding their, your email address, making sure they watch the repository so they get notifications, but make sure you're providing clear value on, on both sides. Uh, so I keep talking about stakeholders, and we, and we often talk about stakeholders as developers. A lot of people coming up to the table um, downstairs for GitHub are like, GitHub's great, but I'm not a developer. I have no reason to use it. There's a whole world of people that can get value out of open source. I mentioned the boss, making sure you're providing value for him or her, charts, graphs, metrics, numbers, all those good people wear, suits people wearing people alike, um, but also potential users, right? What's, what does this project do? Why does this project make my life better? Non-technical users, what kind of documentation do I need? need to actually use the thing. Um, veteran users, how do you encourage them to become contributors? Um, subject matter experts, maybe they can do a, a, a accessibility review, an internationalization review. Obviously, uh, developers can, can provide changes to de potential developers, uh, making sure that they have the ability to contribute if they want to. But there's all sorts of different ways to contribute that are not code. Right, if someone submits a bug report, even if my aunt submits a bug report that says like, I went to your website and I couldn't read it on my iPad, that's really helpful for me, right? Um, so just making sure that there are different forums and different people that you're providing value to, um, and you grow your community, the potential community beyond just people that have Mountain Dew cans and, and uh, Doritos crumbs all over the place, but to people that, that might not think of themselves as potential stakeholders for your open source project. Don't know what open source is, don't have any reason to get involved um, with open source. Uh, I've had, I keep all my documentation for my projects in GitHub itself as markdown files. People find a typo, they hit edit, they change, they hit submit change, and all of a sudden people that have never committed to open source before that are just lurkers um, can now all of a sudden contribute to documentation. Or on the flip side of that, if they're like, hey, I went through and I needed to, to do this thing, I tried doing it, it was super confusing, here's how I would explain it, and they then submit that themselves, they help make your documentation better. Translations, uh, if you have any sort of developer outreach, have super fans, have big power users, serve as genius bars at meetups, it makes them feel really great, um, and have them just give feedback, right? If you people can subscribe to the GitHub repository, or if you have a listserv, and you can say, hey guys, we're thinking about adding this feature, would you use that? Um, especially for government that develops software directly for citizens, that we're all on the same team, there's no kind of like, oh, we're disclosing that we're thinking about doing this, so our competitor might you know, take that advantage. Uh, it's a really, really powerful tool. So where do you get started with this? Next steps and resources. Um, the biggest takeaway that I can give you today is that the technology is the easy part. It's not a question of can your organization commit code. It's not a question of can you use open source. It's not a question of can you contribute to open source. It's a question of can you shift the workflow. The, the air aircraft carrier that is your organization, can you turn it around midstream? right? Um, and start thinking about things a different way, a different workflow, a different philosophy, um, a different way of delivering citizen services. Um, and the, the advice there would be to start as small as possible. Um, maybe you create a list of best lunch places near your office and you throw that up on GitHub as a Git repository, just, just inside your organization. Only you guys can see it. Um, and, and you have people submit pull requests for their favorite place to get lunch. Um, there's an open source project called Taco Fancy that is the best taco recipes 
and has different tacos, has different components. I know there's a GitHub repository with um, different drink recipes, how to make the best Manhattan, right? Anything that is that has no risk, that's stupid, silly, best chocolate chip cookie recipe, just to go through the motions um, and get your legal department involved, get your security team involved, get your procurement office involved. Um, and you kind of learn to do things in a low risk way, because if worst case scenario it gets out that you like, you know, the Chinese place around your office, like that's not a really bad thing. Or maybe if you accidentally delete that line, again, not a really bad thing. Learn in really small ways. The other interesting way to get started is what I like to call feedback repositories. Um, it's just it's basically saying, okay, GitHub is a social network. Um, we want to engage our software developers. We know we have software developers that live in our community. We know we have developers that are using our data and using our API. So just create github.com slash agency slash feedback as a repository with no code in it whatsoever. Just a readme file that says, hey guys, um, we're really glad that you're passionate about making our city better, our state better. Um, we're here to talk to you. If you have any questions, open up an issue. Uh, USAID did this, and they got some, some really great feedback, and a handful of federal agencies are doing this. And you don't need to be technical. You don't need to commit a single line. It's just basically a listserv. But rather than making developers come to you, you go to where the developers are. Um, obviously, open source an existing project you have. If you have something small, especially front end stuff, that I can just hit view source and get anyways. Your, your security team can't really make an argument that you're disclosing something that's not otherwise disclosed. Uh, jQuery widgets, CSS files, anything around Google Analytics. Think about the problems that you're hearing in other talks this week that are, uh, might be shared problems between other similarly situated organizations. And what can you put out there to kind of create a community and make those kind of tasks better? Um, next time you start a project, Something small, something big started out in the open. Um, but the biggest thing there is don't take the six year website redesign and make that the first thing you do is open source. You can do it. You're going to be, there's going to be a lot of Advil involved. Um, and last is just communicate more openly within your organization, right? You can do all this stuff without doing open source. Um, like I said, everything on GitHub is totally free, but you can take this workflow and you can take it to Google Docs. You can take it um, to a spreadsheet on a shared drive. The tools might not be exactly the same, but start with the philosophy, start with doing things more openly, and don't start, make the default to be open. Make it so everyone that can possibly have access to this does have access to this, even if they might not use it right away. Um, so if you want to learn more, government.github.com is a nice digital kind of one pager that just explains um, you know, WTF GitHub is and how you might use it and links out to some examples of cool organizations that are, that are doing some great stuff. That's something you can send to your boss, you can send to your colleagues, and it has some links to some very useful resources like a glossary and stuff like that. Um, but the one thing that I definitely, definitely recommend that you get involved with, if you are a government employee, you have a government email address at any level of government whatsoever, um, github.com slash government is a semi-private community um, open only to government employees. So it verifies you have a, a government email address. And it's just a forum for collaborating on best practices, for answering common questions about uh, accounts and, and administration and, oh, hey, um, our, our mayor says this. Can we do that or, or anything like that? So github.com slash government. It's all about 500, 400 government employees that are all similarly situated to you. There's a, a list of previous questions that have already been asked along with some documentation. Uh, if you take one thing away, Get coming up slash government um, so you can talk directly to other government employees. I'm glad to answer questions afterwards, but um, that rather than me kind of paraphrasing what somebody else has done, you can ask them directly. Um, so the slides for this are up online, ben.balta.com slash open source demystified. The source code is also online because, of course, the slides have to be open source and they're on GitHub. GitHub.com slash benbalter slash open source demystified. And I'll leave this up if you want to um, copy that down. Um, but like I said, uh, we got about uh, 10, 15 minutes now left in the session. If you need to d duck out, I won't be offended. Um, or, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be here to take some, some questions, and then we can continue the conversation uh, when the time is up downstairs, down by the, by the food and the snacks. Uh, and I'll be here all week, and I'll be glad to, to continue the conversation. So like I said, I'm here because I am passionate about open source, and I'm an open source developer, and I'm a govy, and I want to make your lives as easy as possible. So feel free to, to reach out. My email address is up there, and let me know how I can be uh, most helpful. But otherwise, thank you, and, and if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Answered everything. Awesome. Uh, questions about Back to the Future are also ap applicable as well. So, like the hoverboard, right? It, it can't go on the water, but it floats, and I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have an iPhone app, but we don't. Have, we no longer have a developer, but we'd like to open source it so our, our program can play around with it. Yes. 
wondering if that's bad mojo to put it up there, even though we're not going to touch it. No, it's, it's absolutely great. And that, that's what that was lying there, just talking about the project status. As long as you're explicit and say, look, we developed this. Um, we don't currently have any resources in-house to continue to develop it. But we're putting it out there for the, for the community to, to help us with it, to give us feedback on it. Um, and maybe you know, a year from now, we'll, we'll have some, some help. Or if, like, if, you have, if there's a pull request, even if there's no one in the agency that can, or the organization that can review it, that has the technical eyes to review it, if there's a pull request to correct a typo, that can easily be merged. Uh, and if there's a pull request that you know, 30 people are like, this is a great change, I'm a developer, I approve this message, um, you can probably start going down that route. But I'd say as long as, um, th th there's many people have done this before, and as long as you're explicit about it, uh, I think the community will appreciate the code. Uh, and not to mention, other people probably in this room would appreciate to see that code, because I imagine they can just swap out your name for their name and take credit for what I'm sure is a great app otherwise. That's open source, you're allowed to do that. Well, they'll, they'll like give you credit or something on the bottom, but <laughs> they'll see the fork at the top. Yeah. Thank you. One thing that feels weird is when I do do a pull request on GitHub, GitHub that you know I have to create a fork that's then on my shows up on my account, which is you know over time. Yes. Like super far behind. Yes. Like the actual master, and it, it shows that it's a fork, but I don't know. It just feels weird to me that there's this project that's not my project. Yes. Part, part of that is just kind of the, the baggage of the WordPress community. Uh, WordPress, I keep saying that. The baggage of the open source community and just kind of uh, where what Fork has meant traditionally that I can take that code and make it my own. Um, the, the two solutions I would recommend is if you're doing collaboration within your organization, uh, at GitHub, we don't fork things. Um, everyone that has commit access to a project just creates a feature branch within that project. Um, so if I'm working on you know, github.com slash github slash github, the main GitHub application, um, I'll just create a new feature branch that says, you know, make sidebar blue. I would make my commits to that and I submit a pull request within the repository from one branch to another. This is for an outside project. Yeah, I can't help you there. No, the, the, way, the, way that I, the, way, the other way to do that is there are, if you, I gotta Google it, I gotta follow up, um, but there are several projects out there that keep your forks in sync, or at least keep the master branch of your fork in sync. Um, that uh, you just set it up as a either hit a button or like set it up as a post receive hook that, or maybe it's a timer that every like 24 hours it just syncs in all the changes for master. Or you could, once you submit your protocols, you can just delete it. That's what a lot of people do. And then just refork it next time, okay. if you don't really care about it. Um, I guess the other thing is you can keep it up to sync if you want, but that's like, I don't, yeah. it reminds me of what are those like little baby trees where you like use the scissors and like die? Don't, don't prune your forks. <laughs> Bonsai tree, that's what I was thinking for. Outside of, uh, not in Back to the Future, so I didn't know it. Anything else? Is there a good source for like a, a white paper or something that's a, just for open sourcing a project. Like we have a very large project that we're trying to get open source, but there's internal resistance too. And so rather than being putting together like that list of reasons, we're really going in depth, especially about security and things like that. Or something. There are other sources. Yes. Yes. The two books I would undoubtedly recommend um, is one is literally called Producing Open Source Software by Carl Fogel. Um, who literally wrote the book on producing open source software. And it goes through licensing, it goes through how to co contributors, how to manage governance within a project. It's short, it's maybe 75 pages. I think you can get it online for free if you just want to read it online. Um, but it's a great soup to nuts, everything about open source. And the other one is The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which I'm blanking on the author of that, but there's nothing remotely named similar to that, um, which is the more philosophical why open source is good and makes that argument. It's a, lot, a little bit longer. It's probably 150, 200 pages. Um, but it makes the argument for why open source is, is good and used. And they're, they're kind of the two books that have existed for probably 20 years each that kind of define this. Uh, Producing Open Source Software by Carl Fogel. I can actually, we have the technology. Uh, cathedral, oh, now you're all going to see my history. Uh-oh. Cathedral and bizarre. Good thing I don't have anything scary in here. What's up? Carl actually spoke. Oh, yes. Eric Raymond. And then, I can leave that up there for a second, and producing open source software. Producing open source software.com. It's right there. So you can, get, you can get both of them online uh, completely, completely free. Those are, those are the two big things. Uh, in terms of white paper specific to government, I don't know that it has to be specific. Th those would be the two that, that I would look at. Let me, if you bug me via email, I, I, I feel like that has to exist. 
Oh, the other one, it's a blog post, but it's something I, the, I like the arguments in here. Um, one of our founders wrote a post called Open Source Almost Everything, which is the philosophy behind how GitHub approaches open source. And it makes some really interesting arguments um, about what you should open source and what you shouldn't open source and why it's good. It talks about attracting talent and um, modularization, reducing duplication, and makes some of those kind of uh, strong arguments for open source that aren't just kind of those generic arguments that you might get out of um, producing open source software or Cathedral and Bazaar. Those are, those are the three resources that I recommend. But if you email me, I can try to do some, some deeper digging. Or, or, ooh, shameless plug, if you ask in the Go back a slide. If you ask in the open government community, uh, they might have some resources as well. <laughs> Sweet. I think with that, I'll, I'll oh yeah. Uh, ben, this might be a question for you or, or maybe the rest of the group here. Um, our city has a very active development community. And we're getting political pressure to put some of our source code out on GitHub. Um, we're actually actively using Git internally for our development processes. Um, and we're developing our new website on Drupal uh, using a lot of modules, but we haven't developed any custom modules. We're really just starting to trying to configure and build the site off of that. And we're, tr we're, having, we're struggling coming up with a good example of source code for us to put out there, um, out there on GitHub to engage the, the local development community. Yeah, so there, uh, that's a great question. And the, the best analogy I can bring is data.gov. Um, which went through a similar problem with WordPress. Uh, so they have their WordPress site and a bunch of community contributed plugins and then like a custom theme and that's it. Um, so obviously I, I assume you're doing some sort of custom skinning. So putting the actual theme out on, on GitHub would be a great way to engage the, de the designer community. Um, and then also if you have Nginx configuration, Apache configuration, the configuration files, none of that stuff is going to be sensitive, right? It's going to say if they ask for a file with a slash, give them index.html, right? Um, a lot of that stuff can be put out there. The list of plugins that are modules that you're running, so maybe you're running one cache plugin and the community contributes and be like, no, that's a stupid plugin. You want to use this plugin, which does that and 50 other things. Um, and depending on the way, I forget how Drupal works. I, if I remember correctly, you actually write configuration files to disk for a lot of things. Um, anything except for passwords, those configuration files could be put out there. There are different ways to do that. Um, again, my background's in, in WordPress, so I can tell from the WordPress world, there's a thing called um, WP Skeleton, which is a design pattern for storing an entire WordPress site in Git and automatically excludes sensitive config files and automatically excludes GitHub core, or WordPress core as just a submodule. So theoretically, you can submodule in Drupal core. You can submodule in the different uh, plugin dependence, uh, module dependencies, and then have your entire deploy, which hopefully you're managing in some sort of deployment mechanism, anyways. Put that deployment mechanism out there so I can run a local instance of my site, of your site, on my computer, or I can maybe I'm an expert in deployment, and I can be like, oh hey, this can, if you change this one configuration file, your site will be three times as fast. So kind of open sourcing the kind of pulling back the curtain on and anything you change that's not Drupal core would be my recommendation. But take a look at uh, data.gov, which is I think under the GSA repo. Uh, they did that, I, I, they're, they're, they've learned some lessons with the way they did it, but they basically did that play where people would open up issues against, they basically put out a document and said this is our, our framework, this is our architecture, and people would submit issues against their architecture. And if you're creating a custom module, just come on the Drupal side. Yeah, I, I'm trying to translate. If you're creating something that's like a custom module or a custom theme in a way that you think would be useful to other people, then that's something I put on Drupal.org. Of course. Because that's where people are going to be going for that. Yep. But for example, if you've got your custom theme and it's you know it's it's specific to how you're doing things and not a general framework for a design, that's probably a very good thing to put on um, to GitHub if it's not something. T totally. I would, I'd make the distinction if you're using it for community engagement, like you want to make your citizens feel in, in involved with the process and give them an opportunity, GitHub would be the place to do that. If it's something for the Drupal community, Drupal would be the place to do that. Either way, you want to go where the developers are. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah. so if, it's, if it's the developer community you want to engage and interact with, uh, my company actually just started a developer forum on you know, created a repo, and the issues in that repo are, are used by developers to ask questions. Raise issues, um, suggest enhancements. Um, that's not my idea. That was yeah. actually some, an idea that I felt engaged with. You know, 
Harvey open the open America Gate came up with. I thought it was a great idea. It's meeting all of our needs. Yeah. Something developers use anyway. So as Ben said earlier, you go where the developers are. So even if you don't have you're not sure what to put out there yet, you can put a repo out there that has either an architecture document or some sort of policy document just to write up that says this is where we want to engage developers come and create an issue. I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about yeah. it. Through how we set it, you know, pretty easy. Yeah, and also the, another good example is the, the feedback repo. Just saying, like, if you have any questions about our website, just open an issue right here. Just basically putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is the home for our developer community. Please come talk to us. Uh, the one thing I, I need to point out, uh, the stuff at the, at the beginning with all the Git command line stuff, uh, we have cheat sheets downstairs at the table that if you didn't, if you can't read your handwriting guy like me, uh, that walk through everything and more. And I keep it on my desk. It's really useful, along with markdown cheat sheets and all sorts of other other goodies. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll give you. I know I'm cutting into break time. Uh, I'll be here. I'll, I'll be downstairs at the, the table. I'm glad to answer any questions, chat more, or feel free to, to reach out anytime. But but thanks a lot. <laughs>